then you've got to get, get some woodpeckers and blue jays and chickadees and stuff like that. Okay, I don't know who's counting what. On the I don't know why it's right on the ground. You can hear. The woodpecker's up there if you're interested. by a white girl. Yeah, but I tried to have a bite. I tried to annual Christmas bird count. Is that amazing? 109 years. Who was here the first one? <laughs> <laughs> This year, they've been the leaders for 109 years. The Audubon Society, both on the, the national, the state, and the city level, an extraordinary nonprofit group that does so much for birds from trying to get the tall buildings to turn out their lights at night so the birds aren't drawn to them and fly into them, to working with us to build the country's first urban Audubon Center in Prospect Park, working with us to redefine our landscaping plan so that we can do better habitat. And um, they have been uh, great friends of ours, and I guess the most fun thing we did together was trying to get the building here on Fifth Avenue to reestablish the nesting place for Pale Mill Lola. <laughs> and it's now my great pleasure to introduce the president of the Audubon Society, who's been our wonderful partner for all these many years, John Flicker. <laughs> You know, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, this Christmas bird count started back in 1900. And as I was walking around the ramble today, counting chickadees and tufted titmice, uh, I, I thought back to Frank Chapman, who really started it all. He was an ornithologist over at the American Museum of Natural History and one of the founders of the Audubon Society, uh, who realized, you know, the side hunt was going on back then when people would choose sides to see who could shoot the most birds on Christmas Day. And they decided to figure out how to get people to watch birds instead of shoot them. And I don't think they had any idea what they were starting back then and the impact it would have had and that we would still be here 109 years later still doing the same thing. If you're part of a vast network of, of citizen scientists and volunteers who are out both enjoying birds but doing something that's increasingly important. What you're doing is really important science. Uh, we're compiling this data from the Christmas bird count and the breeding bird surveys and other monitoring. This is the longest running wildlife monitoring program in the world, ever. Um, it's, it's become that important. And out of this, we're now producing, as some of you may know, uh, about a year ago, uh, we produced the uh, Birds in Decline report that showed common birds in decline. Not birds that are on the endangered species list, but common ones you know, that had been common and are increasingly less common, eastern meadowlarks. You know, uh, you know, uh, bob white quail, things like that. Uh, and we found that nearly a quarter of the species of birds that we know have declined more than 50% in the last 40 years. I mean, that's stunning. If you graph that out, I mean, that's a graph like this. Now, they're not on the endangered species list yet, but these are birds that we know and love and are used to seeing every day. Uh, unless we reverse that trend, they're going to be in the endangered species list, and we're going to lose many of them during our lifetimes. And that report was made possible by the long-term monitoring and tracking that you do. Uh, so you're part of a really important scientific endeavor. And the fact that you're out there and show up year after year after year uh, has, is taking on increasing scientific importance. And as we think about what our children and grandchildren will see, they're going to be looking back at our accounts now, and hopefully they will be doing the same thing. Uh, and maintaining this, this amazing, wonderful tradition. 
I want to recognize somebody today who has carried on this tradition probably better than anybody in the room. We have a uh, privilege to have with us today Irving Cantor. Who again, First Christmas word count in 1935. Or would you come up here? I'd like to have you say a few words about that. It's a little different than it was uh, 73 years ago on December 27th when I did this count by myself. <laughs> and it was published. It was published in the year. Uh, Bird Law Magazine, even though but I had a three wing teal. I'm sure you didn't get that. I had two pintails. I had a pheasant. Mm. I had 18 wood ducks. And that, I, an interesting thing, I had 175 black duck and, and 40 mallards. And that illustrates how the mallard, the black duck, the mallard has taken over the black duck. They, they're a closely related species, and they've interbred so much, but the mallard is the, is the uh, dominant species. But that's an example of, of what one little observation in Central Park does. Can anybody think of a better example of how one person can make a difference? Did that count alone back in 1935? I'd like to recognize another person who really makes a difference, Glenn Phillips, New York City Audubon Society. <laughs> Wood duck. Northeast. One. Northwest. Zero. Reservoir. One. Great lawn. Ramble. Southeast. Southwest. Southeast one. One. Northern shoveler. Northeast. Zero. Northwest. Zero. Reservoir. Sixty-eight. Great lawn. Zero. Ramble. Two hundred and ninety-two. Southeast? Yeah. Southwest? Zero. Uh, Ramble? Zero. Southeast? Yeah. Southwest? Zero. Double crested corn. So we had two total, one from Great Lawn and one from Northwest, right? Okay. Good. All right, Cooper's Hawk. Northeast? Zero. Northwest? One. Reservoir? One. Great Lawn? One. Ramble? Two. Southeast? One. Southwest? One. What's our highest species count? White throated sparrow. White throated sparrow? No, house sparrow. House sparrow. House sparrow, house sparrow. House sparrow. House sparrow nudged out, narrowly nudged out the, uh, the white throated sparrows this year. 